Nancy Yearell, and welcome to Nancy's Psychic View on the High Road to Humanity. And Mark Matusik is back. Welcome back to the show, Mark. Thanks, Nancy. Good to see you. It's really good to see you, too. It's been a while. Gosh, it's been, what, a couple of years, maybe, since yes. you've been on the show. You know, he's written this book. This is really cool, you guys. I was telling him, this is one very well written, by the way. You're a good writer, Mark. I'll say that. Um, the Boy He Left Behind. And this, I'll let Mark tell his story, but it's a man's search for his lost father. And there's a lot of people out there um, who didn't grow up with the dad. And so this is a really good show um, to share. I do want to read a little bit of Mark's bio here. So I'll sit back and relax. And let me tell you a little bit about Mark Matusik. He is the award-winning author of seven books. He was born in Los Angeles and he graduated Phi Beta Kappa from the University of California, Berkeley. He studied on a fellowship at Worcester College in Oxford and was awarded an MA in English Literature from UCLA. So upon graduation, he moved to New York where he worked uh, for Reuters International and Newsweek. This, you have an amazing background, by the way. Uh, he also was hired as a professor uh, as a proofreader at Andy Warhol's interview, where he became the magazine's first staff writer and senior editor. So the following year, and my cat has just jumped up here. So if you guys are wondering what, what's going on, she wants to go outside. But um, he has uh, during his three years uh, at Interview, though he can he conducted hundreds of interviews with well-known figures in film, television, books, fine arts politics, design, and science. And now he's come out with this book. And I this is just really, really cool. But tell us your story. You were, it was really interesting. I mean, it was a book I couldn't put down. You were four years old when your father attempted to kidnap you. But then you find out later, it was actually for the second time. Yes. Yeah. And you dedicate the book to your mom, Ida Matusik. I thought yeah. that was really cool. Well, tell us your story. I'll I'll let you do your thing. Well, I grew up uh, not knowing who my father was. He he, as you just said, he came back to kidnap me. He and my mother had broken up a couple of weeks before, and then one night uh, when she wasn't home and he knew she wouldn't be there, he broke down the door and he grabbed me and tried to get me in his truck. Uh, she grabbed my my feet. She was next door and they stood there and pulled me apart in the driveway. And uh, she got me away from him, fortunately, and got me into the house. And I uh, she wouldn't let me. They sort of barred the door and he honked the horn and he pulled out of the driveway and I never saw him again. So I grew up with this this I, this story about this legend about this miserable human being who had been my father who had come back to get me and how fortunate I was that he wasn't in my life until I was in my late 30s I kind of repeated that story and then a friend of mine I was talking to looked at me like I was crazy he said well weren't you ever curious to know who this guy was I said no no and I gave him the company line about he he was a liar he was a cheat he wasn't a good person mm -hmm. and my friend said I don't think you're really telling the truth I think you're actually very curious to know who this person is and knowing who he was might actually help you figure out so many things about your own life that you have not been able to really uh, make sense of. And yeah, so I, I kind of took him up on, I took him up on the dare basically and hired a detective. Yeah. Well, I want to interject there really quick because you're talking to this guy and he says, you tell him in six years, you've lived in 26 different locations. I want to say this and I didn't want to interrupt your thought. 
But he realized when you told him that you had lived in 26 different locations in six years, that there was something not right here. Yeah, I'm, I, I was, my life was off the rails. Uh, yeah. I, was, I was facing a, a fatal diagnosis. I had left my job. I was running around the world looking for wisdom. And uh, there was something very ungrounded about me. And I never put the two together that having a father, having some sense of who my father had been, might, have, might be integral in some way to how I saw myself as a man. Uh, and my ability to trust people and, and so on. So that's why I hired the detective uh, to look for him, which was something I never expected to do. Right. Now, I want to say something to you. As I read this, as traumatic as it was, I mean, because it's your life and it really was traumatic, I have to say, you know, what I thought was, at least he tried to get you. At least he wanted you. Did you ever think that? Because I kept thinking that. Well, you know, because then you you find out that he had tried to take you. And I don't want to give all the book away because it's a good one. But then you find out later, no one ever told you that he had kidnapped you when you were, how old were you when he kidnapped you the first time, too? A, a few weeks before that, he had tried to, he had, he okay. had taken me and my mother found found us. Uh, okay. That time. A, okay, yeah. So he, were, want, he did want you. I guess I just want to say that. Yeah, I mean, yes. And I thought about that sometimes. I thought, yeah. well, at least, he, at least he came back, though he didn't come back for my younger sister, who was a baby. He didn't, apparently he didn't want <laughs> her. But he, but he did, wanted he, you. He, he wanted his only son. Um, yeah. And what the book did was showed me all these other sides of this story that I had never been told. You know how families create a myth. And yeah, that myth, that myth leaves out a lot of information. Yeah, you know, I I didn't know, for example, that he had walked in on my mother and another man. I didn't know that he had causes for his own, you know, issues. And right, right. You start to look at the other side of the coin and like, wait a minute, maybe this guy wasn't such a bad guy. Maybe there was a reason. You know, it was very healing. Yeah, and that's why it was healing. Yeah. Well, um, you know, and I just want to say, you also talk about looking for enlightenment and looking for love um, when you're in the book. Now, when you grew up, your mom, I want to rewind because your mom was a problem child. Her father wanted a boy. You tell the story. And again, I'm not going to give it all away, but they immigrated from Poland. My grandfather immigrated from Russia. My grandmother immigrated from Poland. Yes. And she was a spitfire. Yeah, she was. <laughs> she was. And my and my mom and my mom was a bad girl. She was the she she developed very young physically and she uh she was problem. She was a trouble. You know, she was not a nice She's a little Jewish badass. <laughs> she was a badass. She was not a nice Jewish girl and she caused them untold misery. That's uh, and when she met my father, uh he was Catholic and we were born Jewish and my grandfather insisted that he uh, he go to Hebrew school and change his name, you know, have a Hebrew name, or he wasn't going to give them any money for the dowry. So my father was apparently sort of bribed into converting to Judaism. Uh, but my mom, my mom never fit into the family. She was the black sheep. Yeah, um, she was, and she was a very troubled person. She was, she was somebody who probably shouldn't have had kids at the time that she did. But in that era, that's what a woman. Those yeah, yes, what you did. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you do hire a private investigator, Sullivan, and to find your father. And he works on this for a long time. But I guess what really surprised me more than anything in this book, as you were talking about before, you go back to your mom and you try to get your mom to, you know, like, how come she didn't know his middle initial? Like, you couldn't even get that out of her, right? I mean, it was, that's kind of, it was a difficult situation because you she wouldn't tell you anything. She didn't know anything. And it turns out my father was a compulsive liar. She had never met his parents. Okay. Uh, she met him. They ba basically had a kind of a one night stand kind of a thing. And he being in that era, that being that era, he married her. But it wasn't a, a deep relationship. And my father was a mystery person. He didn't, after, after he left, we found out my mother found out, I later learned things about him that she never shared with me. Uh, and so it wasn't entirely her fault, though Though she, was in, she wasn't paying that deep attention. She was in love with somebody else through both of her marriages. So 
that was a problem. Yeah, crazy. Now you did have a sister. Or you do have a sister. Is Bella still with us? Is she? Yes. Yes. yes, yes. Okay. And she was named after the grandmother. Yes. So it's yes. Bell and Bella. Is that right? Yes. Bella was our grand, our little Polish grandma, and my mother anglicized it a little bit to Bell okay. for my sister. Now, was she on board when you were doing this? My mother, absolutely. Bell. Oh, your mom, no, Bell, was Bell? No, my mother was not. My mother wasn't. It took a lot of convincing for my mom to get even halfway on board. My sister was, yeah. She got very excited at the thought that she might meet her father. It's, yeah. it's strange because she was only one year old when he left. I was four, but she felt his absence more than I did. And when we were growing up, she would say, oh, I wish we knew him. And I just put him out of my mind. Uh, to me, he was that. That was a fait accompli. The, the door was closed. But mm. Belle had this longing. So when I told her my idea uh, and hired the detective, she was extremely excited, and she was sure that we were going to find him and yeah. we were all going to live happily ever after. <laughs> I love it. Well, I think as you're talking, um, I have three had three sisters, and um, two of them have passed, which is kind of crazy. But you know, girls are funny about their father. We were always really close, more close to my dad. Well, I was always close, to, more close to my father. And I think that's a girl thing. I really do. But you, I have to say, and you talk about it in the book, you grew up with all women. So there was like always women around. You didn't really have any male influence. That was the hardest thing. I grew up in this, I, I compared it, it's like, a, imagine a big egg and a sperm a, a, a little, tiny little sperm circling this enormous egg. That's how I felt in our house. Oh my. I, felt, I felt like this, this little <laughs> man who fell to earth, boy who fell to earth in this family where I didn't belong, surrounded by crazy women. Uh, <laughs> I loved, but they were, they, were, they were a mess. And so that was the hardest part. It, it was, there was the, there's the absence of this particular man, but then there's not having any kind of a role model. Uh, and my mom did her best to, she sent me to Jewish big brothers and she tried to find role models for me and it never worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, why did you decide to put it together? Why did you decide to write it? I, because there's so many people who are without dads. You know why I'll tell you, because for me, it was never as much about finding him as it was about finding myself as a man. Right. And figuring out what masculinity meant, what 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 is manhood, uh, what is toxic masculinity? Why is there all this shame around men? Because in my family, men were always the bad guys. My father was the son of a bitch who got who you know who left us in the dirt. Yeah. Uh, when I did something bad, my mom always said, "Oh, you're you know you're nasty, just like your dad." So men were always associated with negativity, okay. and so a big part of doing this for me was trying to retrieve a positive sense of what it means to be a man. You know, Robert Bly, the poet and, and the Jungian said that men in their late 30s uh, develop a longing, a real desire to know their fathers. Whether yeah, I the read fathers, that. Whether the fathers were in the house or not. Right. And it's not accidental. I was in my late 30s here. I was sort of on the cusp of middle age. Right. And saying, you know, what now? Uh, it's not accidental that I wanted to find him at this time. You know, it, it was kind of fit. I was right on. I was right on schedule uh, in terms of psychological development. A lot of men at that age are struggling with being dads themselves, and they mm -hmm. want to go to their fathers and say, "How did you do it?" Right. That exactly. was. I didn't. I didn't have children, but I did have a longing to figure out what was this man thing, and why was it so loaded. Why was being a man so loaded with, with all these negative connotations? Yeah, I think this is a really good book for anybody to read, let alone, I think, people who haven't had a father influence in their household. You know, we're in a, a weird place right now, um, mm -hmm. you know, with man, women, father, mother, this whole role thing. And um, I'm glad you brought this to the forefront because I thought it was interesting that you said in the th in your 30s, you started to feel the need for this. And it seems like, I don't know, I'm going to agree with you. Like the guys have really gotten the bad um, rap on this whole situation. You know, they really have. I feel like, of course, you know, I've had my own relationships, but I just feel like it should be equal. It should be 
a man and a woman and they both have equal everything or whatever, whether it's man or women or partners or however you want to put it, a relationship should be equal. And it almost has always felt like for me growing up, of course, I'm a little old fashioned. It was always kind of a little off. Like the man did whatever the woman wanted to please her. Do you know what, did, I mean, it's like one person was always trying to please the other person instead of being equal. And I would like to see that. What do you think? Yeah. Oh, I, I completely agree with that. The, the thing is that men end up paying the price for patriarchy. You know, yeah. patriarchy, patriarchy is a real thing. Patriarchy is a big problem. Uh, and men. Well, what do you mean by a, patriarchy? What do you mean patriarchy, by patriarchy? Uh, the chauvinistic, uh, male-dominated uh, um, system that we inherit, where women are paid half as much as men, and have you know, and and have do twice as much work, and the patriarchy is a is an entrenched cultural system. That's one thing. Being a man is something else. I'm not responsible for the patriarchy. I didn't create this system. Yeah, 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 exactly. But as men, as men, we end up paying the price very often for mm -hmm. this patriarchal system. It's like paying uh, the price for the sins of your fathers, mm -hmm. you know, and the same goes with, with violence against women and all the many things. These are real things. I that... know there's no, yeah, there's no, um, Respect, you know, I didn't want to interrupt your thought there, but I yesterday I was watch. I don't like to watch the news very often, but I like to be informed. So I, I get tidbits and I turned it on yesterday afternoon and they were showing this man on the subway, this young boy beating this 60 year old woman with her cane in the subway. I don't know if you saw this or not, but I, I saw this and there's such a disconnect right now in our world. Why in the, like when I grew up, you would never think of ever hurting an elderly person. Mm -hmm. And in this day and age, whether people are just psychotic, they should be in a mental home or whatever, the respect, I guess I just want to say that is just not there anymore. And there mm -hmm. used to be so much respect. Like I always respected my father. Like if mm -hmm. my father said something, it really meant something. Like, you know, I respected that. Anyway, I want to bring something up that you say in the book and you talk about your mom goes back to work. Yeah. And this is something we're just talking about. She, you said to her, you need to stand on your own two feet. Mm -hmm. yeah. You need to be responsible for yourself and not hang out with somebody who you, you know, are counting on to take care of you. Right. I really like that. Talk about this. I mean, this was, it was huge. My mom, as a person of that generation, had always defined herself according to the relationship she was in and the men she was with. That defined whether she was successful or, or not. And she had been in love with someone else, as I mentioned earlier, through both of her marriages. My father was gone. We were on welfare. Uh, and actually, it was my grandmother, my step grandmother, who said to her, you know, Ida, you can't just sit around waiting for a man to come and save you. Yeah. And my, and my mother, who had been in a severe depression for many years, uh, went and took the civil service test in Los Angeles. And she got like a 96 percentile on, on, on the test. She was actually an intelligent woman, but she had never known Used it, it. Yeah. at all. And she had never given herself any credit for it. And she got a job and she, it, that, that really began, began a whole second chapter in her life that we were really happy for. It didn't make her a more natural mother. She wasn't a maternal type, but her, she got a lot of self-respect that she, that she needed at that time. Well, yeah. And, and I want, that's such a big point. And I'm so glad you put this in the book because there's so many women, even today, who you know, well, this is who I'm married to. And, but you have, I guess I've lived a while. <laughs> and I just think it's really important that everybody, man or woman, be self sufficient. I don't think you should count on a woman or count on, I don't think you should count on another person. Mm -hmm. I think you need to, I love how you said stand on your own two feet. Somebody taught me that when I was younger. And yeah. it's true because, um, you know, you don't want somebody to tell you, no, you can't have that. Or no, you can't do that. It right. takes away your freedom. I guess that's what it is. And that's why I was so glad that you brought it up in the book. Because I think if we could just get that across to young men and young women that stand on your own two feet, do your own thing, be your who be you are. Exactly. It, and it's it's a it's a tricky thing because of course we depend on one another. We're connected. 
Well, uh, that's different. We, yeah. We need to lean on each other. We're attached to one another. So it's not denying any of that. Right. But within that, uh, we need to have a, a, a level of autonomy and self-trust. Mm -hmm. So both, both are true. You know, you don't want to go too far into individualism because that can, well, that, can make you, that can make you arrogant and no, push people that. away. It's a self-respect thing, Mark. It's a self-respect thing. It's yeah. like, oh, I'll have to ask my husband if I could. I've had people say to me, I'll right. have to ask my husband if I could do that. Or let me ask my wife and make sure it's okay. I mean, I don't know. I just feel, <laughs> anyway, we'll get off that subject for a second. So what I also found really interesting, and again, you guys, really good book. I don't want to give it all away, but your mom, before she dies, before she passes, she finally starts talking about your dad. Yeah. 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 That's it crazy. Was a, yeah. It was extraordinary. It was uh, about a year before she died. She told us that he had found her uh, and he had walked in on, on her and her lover, the man she was in, truly in love with. And that's, that was what had caused my father to leave for the first time. We never knew that. We were just told that he was an abandoner. Um, and then as we were, as she got sick and as she got a little more tender and open, she said some things about him that she had never said before, like he was very sensitive. She said he was too sensitive for me, which I thought was a very kind of telling comment. Um, mm -hmm. He was sensitive. His feelings could have hurt. He loved poetry. You know, things that we had never known about my dad slowly, slowly, you know, started to come out. Um, Interesting, never, huh? Yeah, she was never in love with him. So it's not like suddenly her heart opened. No. Right. Uh, but from going to from stony faced refusal to say his name to yeah. being able to say he was a very sensitive man and he was too sensitive for me. That was a quantum leap for my mom. Well, why was she so angry at him? Well, that that's a long story. My mother well, was angry. Well, she was angry to begin with. She was an angry person who had an angry been, person. Yeah. She had gone through uh, sexual abuse as a girl. She was right. never taught that she had any self-worth. And you uh, write about that in the book. I just want to mention you write yeah, about abuse, yeah, yeah. which was, I was really shocked at yeah. that. Yeah. And she went, so she was, she was very angry to begin with. And, and then when my father left, he left us without any child support and she had to go on welfare. And so she never forgave him for that, even though she had helped precipitate the breakup. Um, she blamed she, him instead of herself. She was, yeah. bit, she was a bit of a victim. My mom's been dead many years and, and I, and I loved her and, and she could be, she played the victim a lot. And the part of being the victim is having, is feeling like it's their fault. It's being done to you and uh, just nursing this grudge against the world. Crazy. But she, uh, did she let it go before she passed? I don't know. I, I was with yeah. her when she passed. We took care of her at home. Yeah. She never, she never had any, any major epiphany. Uh, the, the, the most, the most insightful or amazing thing my mother said was the day before she died, she asked my sister, she said, am I dying, Belle? And my sister Belle said, well, it doesn't look good, mom. She said, it's not that bad. <laughs> I love it. Oh my God. Which, thought, which, which was probably the only kind of wisdom teaching I ever got from my mom. <laughs> what has but what did Belle say about the book? What has the family said about the book? I'm curious. They really, they she loved the book. And, and yeah. I was a little worried because I say, I'm very honest in the book about yeah. my sisters and their lives and what we all went through. And some a lot of it isn't pretty. My oldest sister committed suicide and uh, my youngest sister, Belle, my only whole, uh, you know, full blood sister had a really rough time. And I was worried that she was going to you know, ask me to take things out or... And she really said, she said, thank you for telling the truth, which nice. I thought was really, was really big of her. That's nice. Now, what it's been out since July. Is that right? Uh, well, it was first published in, in 2000. Okay. But and it, it, it's been republished. It, it, yes. The, the, new, uh, the new edition came out in July. Uh, and it's great. It's wonderful to see it have, having, having a second life because this issue of the absent father is mm -hmm. really a cultural phenomenon. And that's whether you grew up in, in a house with fathers or not. Uh, so many people grew up with emotionally absent fathers where the dads were there in body, but not in mind or spirit. Mm -hmm. um, and this book really has a lot to say to those people as well. Uh, it's not, a, your dad, your dad didn't, didn't need to leave physically. 
for you to grow up feeling fatherless. Well, what advice would you give somebody? Um, of course, to buy the book and check it out and read it because it's a really good story. You're a really good writer. I was impressed, Mark. I, I remember a couple of years ago when I read your last book, but this is really good. What would you give, you know, if there was a young man right now or a young woman who, you know, has grown up without a father, what would you tell them? They, that they need to, it's really important to look at the loss, to look at the wound. And that doesn't necessarily mean finding the man, finding the father. And it doesn't even mean having a big reconciliation with your living father if you know who he is. It means addressing the, the father hunger inside yourself and how it's manifested in not trusting yourself, in weird uh, patterns in relationships, uh, in the ways you project negative ideas about masculinity. You know, look at the father wound. It's essential, just like it's important to understand your mother, the mother wound. Right, right, but right. There's a lot more. There's a lot more literature about the mother wound than there is about the father wound. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of science about the the mother's gaze uh, and the importance of a child being seen by his care by the mother, and yeah. there's not so much about the impact of a father to the point where some people, I think, think think that fathers are dispensable now. That that there's a way that I mean, I, I, for example, I know a woman who had a, a baby by sperm, you know, by um, a donor. Yeah, a donor. Yeah. And whenever I've tried to bring this up, like, is there a possibility that your son needs a, a role model? Or is there a possibility? Right. Yeah. She just, she just poo poos it like that's some antiquated idea. Yeah. Like what, you know, like, what are men for? Well, it's kind of crazy because I had the opposite, you know, and I'll just speak for that for a second because my mom was a narcissist. And she, I grew up in the age where they said not to hold the baby. So I never had any kind of, my mother never hugged. She was not a hugger, but I would wait all day long. I'll just say this for my dad to come home because when my father came home, the first thing he did was hug me. Mm -hmm. So as you're talking about this, you're absolutely right. Because what you don't get from one parent, you'll get from the other. Right. Hopefully. Yes. Hopefully. And you need, people need that. Again, we're back to the balance. Yeah. No, yeah. we need both the male and the female because within each of us, I know you've done a lot of work, so you know this, Mark, but we have male and female aspects in all of us. Absolutely. And, and, th and, th and thank God your father had that quote, feminine energy. Oh, he did because my mm -hmm. mom didn't. <laughs> exactly. Thank God. Thank God he had it. So it's not yeah. about gender. It's about, right. it's about the quality of the the way the person relates to you correct yeah and I think about that till this day you know and as I got older of course I was like yeah I was like well where was my mom <laughs> so anyway that's a whole nother show but I'm just saying it, it it's it's really important to have a male and a female um mother and father in the household I really think that I'm really old-fashioned and I think that for, for the reasons we're talking about right now and if and if that's not possible, at least the child needs to have male influences. I agree with that. Or or women, whatever the case may be. It could yes, be. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I see that. And I always think that too, you know, because there's a lot of people that do the um sperm donor thing and and they don't and I think I always wonder, you know, is the kid missing out because they're missing that other and they are. I'm just gonna say, I'm not afraid to say they are. Yeah, it's and it's tricky. It's tricky because I have friends who have done this and I, I love them dearly. And yeah, and, I, they're, and they're actually great parents, but there are but things not, that, yeah. there are things that a woman can't give a son. I, I mean, right. I'm here to tell you, having yeah. grown up, you know, there you know, even if you have a fantastic mother, um, you need there are things that a boy needs from a man that he can't get from women, and that should be so obvious. It seems like common sense. But in this age of sort of gender fluidity, which which I think is fantastic in many ways, but we've forgotten the basics, some of the well, basics of biology and psychology. This is why I don't like it so much, what we're talking about right now. And the reason I don't like it, it's not that I judge anybody, everybody does whatever they want, but I believe it's this way for a reason, like we're mm -hmm. talking about, because of the balance, because it's needed, it's necessary. And that's how we were created, I believe, to have that. Because like, again, we're back to, you know, we've got male and the female. And I didn't really learn so much about that until I got older. I don't know about you, but I started to learn, you know, um, your body is in tune 
also with a male and a female aspect as far as energetically. I will mention that. And I've learned a lot about that as of recent. Um, What have you, any good stories or anything you want to share about that type of thing? It's hugely important. I mean, I I just, I'll speak for myself. I I know as a, as a boy, uh, there's this feeling like half of you is missing. If you don't, if it's not reflected by a male uh character in your life if there's not that kind of you feel like half of you is missing and that can create a lot of alienation it can create a a sense of of being a a stranger to yourself Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's because as you're saying you know energetically we respond to uh to parents differently right Uh, and i do think i do think it's really critical uh and this is not politically correct to say that 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 kids need dads but they do they do they yeah. really do and you know i i hate that there are so many kids you know especially um a lot of ethnic children who have grown up um without fathers uh, a lot of you talk about a lot of the um black community where they don't have fathers and everybody's living on welfare and it's got to change all that's got to change you know what's really bothering me too is watching I'll just say this again, I'm not politically correct, but you know that about me, Mark, all these immigrants that have come across the border, you know, and here's what's so, and I don't want to get into the whole child trafficking, but I see a lot of this going on because if you notice, you see all these and you're close to New York. So you've got all these guys and they're in the hotels in New York, but I want to know where the women and children are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where are the women and children? Where are they? And where did they go? Well, very often there, I mean, that's, it's not uncommon for the man to come and, and wait till he has money for the woman and child to come and for him to send money for them to come later. But absolutely, it's a, it's a, well, I'm, you know what I'm saying? Situation. Yeah, you're watching this and you're thinking, okay, so you've got all these kids and then there's like 84,000 kids that have come across the border and they mm. don't even know where they are. And so I just, you know, the whole family situation, you know, people escaping, trying to have a better life, but is it really a better life? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? To be separated like that as, as we're talking, if you, if you notice, you'll see this. I mean, you can watch any TV program that shows any of these people and these hotels and they're all men. It's yeah, the weirdest yeah. thing yeah, yeah, that's true. going on. And so then I worry about the human trafficking situation that's going on. So I don't know. Yeah we've got a lot of problems in our world and I just love that you wrote this because you were honest and you, you're not afraid to say it like it is. You you know, it's time to get back to basics, man. It's time. Yeah. It's time to get back to, you know, respect for each other. Right. I agree. I I I couldn't come on boundaries and respect. And, you know, where our name meant something and, you know, you could walk down the street and, and feel safe and it's gotten to be really crazy and we just got to get back to the original um values i guess that we used to have what do you want to leave us with today mark this is such a cool book i want you guys to pick this up the boy he left behind a man's search for his lost father this is what it looks like if you're watching me on the youtube channel today what do you want to leave us with mark if if you if you're wondering about your own father wound, if you're wondering why you have negative ideas about men and masculinity, if you're wondering you know about the lack of balance in your emotional life, difficulty trusting, not feeling like you completely belong in the world, uh, I think this book will have something to say to you because that really was my as a spiritual seeker that was my dilemma that yeah. I didn't feel like I belonged in the world. I felt like a stranger in a strange land. And I had never put together those two things that it had to do with this man who had, you know, who had uh, been my dad and who disappeared. It just never occurred to me uh, until until I went on this until I went on this journey. So I hope people enjoy the book. And it's really it's a book for seekers. It really is. I love it. Okay, the boy he left behind. You guys, we got to get out of here for today. But if you want an angel reading, if you want a psychic reading, you can go to my website, nancyyearout.com and book your date and time. Let me think what else I have on there. I will be putting up a new message from Gabriel this week. We've got all the podcasts on there. All the shows are on there if you guys want to watch them. Mark, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Nancy. It's always great to talk to you.
It's great to talk to you. I hope everybody has a terrific week and God bless.